Daniel chapter 2, um, you know, Daniel's life took a turn that he was not expecting. He was a young boy uh, growing up in, the, in Judea, uh, close to Jerusalem, thinking of all the things that, that they were going through. A young boy uh, dreaming of a future, drinking, dreaming of probably uh, having a, a job and taking care of his family, having a wife and kids and raising them and thinking of all the things that you we all think of when we were so young and just uh, the hope of a bright day starting. But his life changed when Babylon came and seized Jerusalem and, and just was taken away to live in a land that he did not know anything about hundreds of miles away by himself, simply with some friends. None of us really know what life has planned. And it really doesn't matter if you're the most powerful person on the known earth or if you're just a little servant boy taken from your home to a foreign land. We don't know what life holds, but we need to know who holds tomorrow. Look what it says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. It said, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we are grateful for another Lord's Day, another Sunday to come together with your people, to worship together, to pray together, to rejoice together, to fellowship together, to sing your praises together. What a privilege and awesome uh, awesome uh, gift from your hand. And Lord, we thank you for your word, your inspirable, infallible word. A, Lord, a word that we pray, Lord, will be high and lifted up, Jesus, to exalt you with your glory, so deserving that you are of it. But Lord, we also know that unless your spirit speaks, unless your spirit is here in power and in your glory to, to draw us to yourself, all is vain. So Lord, as humbly as I know how to say it and to pray it, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart will be anointed and taken by you, O Lord. They will be pleasing to your ears. They will be amplified with your spirit because you're the only one who can speak to the hearts of your people. You're the only one that can call us to yourself. And Lord, what a privilege it is to be ushered into your presence, to sing your praise. What a privilege to know you and to be known by you. So Father, we pray that in these next few moments that you will be at your work in our lives, your workmanship in us. And Father, we will be able to say, oh, what a privilege it is to know you and to be known by you, to be one with you, to hear you speak. Lord, clothe me with your Spirit. As the old preachers would say, hide me behind the cross while all they will see is you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It says in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Notice that. It's in the plural. Not a dream. Dreams. A reoccurring dream. Any of y'all ever dream? Any of y'all ever have silly dreams? I shared in the first service, I, I, I dreamed this dream over and over and over again, and I, I really didn't think about much reason why it kind of uh, escaped me. And I, when I became older, I kind of thought back on that dream. Uh, we was riding down the road in a car. Mom and Dad were in the front seat, and I was in the back seat. And all of a sudden, because the window was cracked, Mama would just suck at the window. And I thought, that's the craziest dream ever. But then when I got older, I started thinking, Mama used to say all the time, if you don't roll that wind up, you're just going to blow me out of this car. And I had a dream where she just got blew out of the car. Y'all ever have some silly dreams kind of like that? I think we all do. How many of you remember all your dreams? I mean, you wake up and you think you're going to remember them. Oh, I'll never forget that. You go brush your teeth and then you're like, what was it I dreamed? 
But there are sometimes, there are dreams that we remember. Sometimes we have those reoccurring dreams. Anybody ever have one of those? April the 14th, 1865, on Good Friday, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was meeting with his cabinet. I just finished a book by Doris Goodwin called uh, on, Le- on Lincoln's life called, uh, um, what was it called? It was such a memorable title, I can just remember it, but uh, it was a rather large book. Uh, Team of Rivals was what it was called. And uh, she said that uh, Lincoln and his cabinet, they would meet every Friday. Sometimes they would meet every day of the week, but they would always meet all of them together every Friday, sometimes Tuesdays, but every Friday. And on that good Friday, Lincoln met with his cabinet and told them that he had had a dream. And it was a reoccurring dream. It's one that he had dreamed before all of the major battles that they had where he would be disturbed in his spirit. But now the, the war was over. Lee, uh, Lee had uh, surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. Uh, Lincoln had actually been with Grant for a couple weeks just before that, but had been called back into to Washington because Secretary of State Stanton had had a, an accident and he had been called back there. But this was the first just meeting with his, his cabinet after that, and he had that same reoccurring dream that he shared with his cabinet. It was, it was Lincoln in a small boat without oars or a rudder, and he was swiftly moving in this great expanse of water to an unseen shore that was ahead of him. He knew that his life was coming to an end and eternity was awaiting him. As a matter of fact, uh, not just over a week before that, he had shared with his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, and four others that were there that he had had a dream where he had come to the White House and he heard all the cries in mourning. And he went into the White House and he saw the people there mourning and there was a casket. And he walked up to the soldier who was there guarding the casket and said, who has died in the White House? And the man looked at him and said, the president. And he went to the to the casket and he looked in and saw his own face shrouded there in the casket. He told his wife, surely that's not me, I'm alive. But then on April 14th, that Good Friday, he went to Ford's Theater that night. Everyone in his cabinet was invited to go, none of them went. Most some other friends, because they were celebrating really the end of the war, were invited as well. None of them went. Even his own bodyguard, who was with him everywhere that he was out in public, was not with him that day. And you know the story. John Wilkes Booth came up behind him, had already been to the theater twice to practice it, went up behind him, shot two shots, one in the very base of his brain. And the president died the next morning, April 15th, and stepped out into eternity. It really doesn't matter who you are. You could be the greatest in the land or just a young teenage boy. We all are faced with an uncertain future. We serve a God who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the high and lifted up one who is on the throne in glory. But it does not matter if you're the king of the strongest country in the world, Nebuchadnezzar, or just a teenage boy. We all wonder about what happens tomorrow. You are a fool if you do not learn from your yesterdays. But you're also a fool if you do not have thoughts to what lies ahead. God has called us to this. He is the author of life. He gives us breath, but he also knows when we will take our last breath. Nebuchadnezzar was absolutely disturbed by this dream, this reoccurring dream, to the place that he called all of his magi. You know the story of Christmas We hear about the Magi from the East. This is where they come from. The magicians, the astrologers, all of the soothsayers, all of the wise people of Babylon. He said, come and tell me my dream. Look what it says in verse 2. The king gave the commandment to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the the Chaldeans to tell the dreams, to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have a dream, and my spirit is anxious. 
to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans came to the king in, in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servant the dream. We will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Did you hear that? Tell me the dream, then tell me the interpretation. If not, you will be killed and the house that you lived in will become a dump. However, he says in verse 6, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its impersonation. He wanted them to know that he needed to know. Verse 9, if you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you give me its interpretation. I'm not going to just tell you my dream. You'll just come up with any kind of nonsense whatsoever. How will I know whether I can believe it or not? But he said, if you can tell me what my dream was, that only I dreamed, only I know, you tell me what the dream is, then by certainty I will know that I can trust in your interpretation of the dream. If you do, I will bless you. If you don't, well, you know what will happen. You will die. Everybody needs answers. I think all of us need at least three answers in life. Number one, you need to know who you are. Who you are. You're unique. Nobody's like you. I know the, people say that everybody has a twin. They may have some unfortunate soul that looks like me, but they're not me. They're not me. We're all different. We all have our own personalities. We all have our own spirit, God-given spirit, our soul that is within us. From the time an Adam and Eve forward, no, we're not one of a mass. You are unique. No one has ever been like you. You may think you don't matter, but you matter to him. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died for the sins of the world, but he died so that you could come to know him. His salvation is full and free for all, but you must receive it. Don't just say someone can take your place. Don't just say that someone else can sing in the choir for you. God wants to hear your praise. We as a church have the awesome privilege, listen to me, to come to take our heart and lift it up to heaven. We get up the awesome privilege. If you don't praise the Lord, He is at deficit. He wants to hear from you. He wants your prayers. He wants your praise. He wants your heart melted with Him. If I've always heard it said, and it's, it's so humbling to think of this, that the God of glory, the God of all creation, would have died on the cross of Calvary if it were only for you. You may say, my life doesn't matter. Your life does matter. And I think it's important for every person to come to know that place in time. Who am I? Why did God create me? What is my purpose? The second question. I wasn't just created just for vanity's sake. I wasn't created just to, to, to go to work every day and to live a life and eat a few meals and, and have a few laughs and do this. Listen, you were created for more. And the wisest and best day is the day that you realize why. But also, the third question I believe everybody needs to know is, where will I spend my eternity? The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. When Lincoln began his presidency, he had not had a change of heart towards God. And while he was in the White House, his second son died. He had already lost one, Edward, when he was three years old. And now Willie, the one that everyone said was the most like Abraham Lincoln, his wife, Mary's favorite, died. And he said, he is gone 
I will see him no more. He thought that you just lived your life and you came to an end and that was just it. But something happened in the expanse of war. God began to deal with his heart. And actually, actually, when you get to the end of his life and you hear the things that he says and how he's looking to God for wisdom and how he's pouring himself out humbly before God, you see that God made a transformation in his life to where he said that he looked forward to seeing Edward and Willie again. All of us have eternity in our heart. But we, need, we don't need to shout it out and drown it out. We need to listen. It's where God comes to you and lets you know, I love you with an everlasting love. I want you to be with me in my heaven forever. Revelation 21 says there will be a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And he talks about a place of peace. No more sadness. No more heartache. No more pain. No more goodbyes. John 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. God says, I will receive you unto myself. And where I am there, you will be always. It really doesn't matter if you're the most powerful man in the world, if you're the richest man in the world, if you're the most attractive in the world, if you have the most gifts of anyone in all the world, or if you're just one insignificant, overlooked person, you have value to Him. God began to speak to Nebuchadnezzar in the same way that He even spoke to His young man, Daniel. So, the call goes from Nebuchadnezzar. Tell me the dream. Tell me the interpretation. If you do not, I don't care. You will die. So the king's counselor, Arioch, comes in verse 14 to tell Daniel. Look what it says, verse 14. Then the counsel and wisdom Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made his decision known to Daniel. He told Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar had said. Verse 16, so Daniel went in and asked the king. Now hold on, he, he heard the decree and he knows that, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill him if he doesn't have the answer. But that doesn't deter him. He goes dead in front of Nebuchadnezzar because he, he has trust and faith in God. He said he went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Evidently, Nebuchadnezzar gave him the time because in verse 17 it says, Then Daniel went to his house, made the decision owed to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven. That's what Philip led us in. This morning, the song of the mercies, his mercies are more. I'm grateful for the grace of God that God bestows, but I'm grateful that the mercies of God are there to take me from depravity, from emptiness, from broken, and give me the treasures of himself. There is nothing that can compete with that. If you were to ask me now, of all the things in all the world, what would you choose? I would choose the very presence of my Savior and my Lord in my heart and in my life forevermore. Nothing can compete with that. Nothing is as good as that. Well, look in verse 18. They came that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon? Verse 19, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. I love that. God, in His mercy, came and blessed him with His presence and blessed him with the answer that he needed for his prayers. And at that point, listen church, at that point he said, I must praise the Lord. I wasn't going to read this because I didn't want to take all the time for it, but I want you to hear this is what comes from the heart of a child of God when God is there for him in his time of need. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God 
forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Have you ever walked through dark times, confusion, uncertainty, trials of heartache, confusion? He was there, but he said he revealed the deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom. You, O God, gave me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demands. How many of you have a God who can? How many of you have a God who is the answer? How many of you have a God who is dependable? How many of you have a God who's always right, who's never late, who always does what's best? Praise God, that's the kind of God we serve. Well, Daniel went to Arioch, verse 24, said, I've got an answer. Look what it says in verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? <laughs> I love the next two verses. This is so good. He said, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. There is a God in heaven who can whisper to your heart. There is a God in heaven who is capable, who is willing to be there. Come on, church, listen to me. For you. For you. There is a God who loves you. There is a God who hears your prayers. There is a God who seeks best for you. What a privilege it is to wake up every day in the shadow of His wings. The protection and love of the Almighty is always there. What is there to worry about? What is there to fret over? What is there that can take away? When God is the, was, is the adding to type of God. Look what it says in verse 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your heads upon your bed were these. He says, you want to know? My God will tell you. This is the dream. For time's sake, I'm not going to go into all of the reading the verses, but he said, O king, you saw a vision. You saw a vision of a being. The head was of gold. The chest and the arms were of silver. The belly and the thighs were of bronze. The legs were of iron. And the feet were iron and clay mixed together. Could you imagine how frustrated Nebuchadnezzar was, but when he heard the words of Daniel, maybe there was a chill that came up. Maybe there was a shaking in his hand. Maybe the Holy Spirit of God amended his spirit and said, I told you, you would hear. Listen, the God of heaven is here to give you the answer. You've heard it from Daniel. Now hear the interpretation. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, have been given by Almighty God the privilege of being over this kingdom and your kingdom will reign over all the earth. But understand this, after you will come another kingdom. Not as you are the head of gold. Another will come inferior to you. It will be of silver. Another kingdom will come after it of bronze. A fourth kingdom will come after it of iron and strength. 
And that will be the four kingdoms, but there will be what we would know as the revival of the fifth kingdom that is the fourth kingdom reborn that is of iron mixed with clay. Iron doesn't mix with clay, and it will falter from within. You, O king, will lead this great nation. It's been this battle for quite some time. It began in heaven with a cherubim by the name of Lucifer who wanted a kingdom beside God. One third of the angels of God's creation signed their allegiance behind Lucifer and the battle was on. They were cast out of the perfect presence of heaven and then they would go from heaven to earth and the battlefield changed from heaven to earth. And you know what happened in the Garden of Eden when Lucifer came to deceive and Eve fell prey to it and Adam joined with them and sin came into this world. And don't you know how the devil laughed at the fall of man? And evil was over all the face of the earth. And when we get to Genesis chapter 6, we see God frustrated and said, enough is enough. I will destroy all, but I'll leave a remnant, Noah. And with the flood, he came and destroyed the earth. Except the ones that were in the ark, they will be taken up out of the place of destruction. Noah and his family began to replenish the earth and multiply. But when we get to Genesis chapter 11, Kyle, if you, I mean, excuse me, Kale, if you would look in Genesis chapter 11, I want you to see these two verses. They're powerful and mighty. In, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Shinar is the land of Mesopotamia. And they were going to build a, 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 a temple there. And they was going to, the, the, the walls, the towers were going to reach up to heaven. And God said, you're not going to do this. There is no heaven on earth outside of Jesus. In verse 6, it said, excuse me, verse 7, it says, Come, let us go down. And there and confuse their language. Us, it says in plural. That's one of those theophanies of the Old Testament. That's where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come together. And they went down to what is called the, the Tower of Babel. And they confused the language and spread them out. They were no longer to be in one place. And, and they gave, were given different language. That's where we get race today. Different people from different places of the earth. God said, you will not do this. But now, in the same land of Shinar, in the land of Babylon, he says, yes, now I will allow. Listen, God will allow a kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, you'll be its king. Another kingdom will follow you of silver, inferior, two arms, the Medio persian Empire, 639. And they will come in. Cyrus, King Cyrus, will set the Jews free. Artaxerxes the second, you may have heard of him. He married Esther. You know the, the book of Esther? And they will be this dominion that will rule the world. But theirs too will come to an end. And the Greek empire will come in. 639. I think it was 623 when this guy by the name of Alexander the Great. You all ever heard of Alexander the Great? 20 years old when he began his conquering. He went and conquered the known world, Egypt, all the way to India, to the north of what we would consider modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, all the way really to Rome. Uh, all of that area, he conquered them all. And, and he did it so quickly, and he cried when he says, there's no one else to conquer. But his came to an end too. And Rome ruled the world, beginning in 280, totally took over in 143 B.C., and ruled for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. But then Rome, as some of y'all have heard of the book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, 
And they described they were not conquered from outside. Where did they fall? They fell from within. And they are the nation in prophecy that will rise again. That will be the feet made of iron, but also of clay. People ask, where is America? Where is America in prophecy? America's not in prophecy. Other than the fact of the Bible says those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who turn their back on Israel will be cursed. And I pray that we learn the wisdom of that and we as a nation will stand strong in support of Israel because the moment that we do not, we will fall as well because God's word is always true. But understand, in the book of Daniel, it begins in Hebrew. But then the language changes to Aramaic. And the Bible stays in that place. As a matter of fact, in the days of Jesus, Aramaic was the language that was spoken. Some knew Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek because it began at that point in time to be a language to the world, to the Gentile world. God has a plan. Look what it says in verse 44. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Did y'all hear that? All of these other kingdoms, the, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the, 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 the belly and the thighs of, of bronze, the, the legs of iron or the, the feet of irons and clay, they will all be destroyed. But it says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand. Say the word with me, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You see, the problem now is we live in this age of grace and the kingdom is your soul. A lot of us feel like we can rule our kingdom. We do what we want. Nobody else will tell us what to do. We'll go as we please. We'll come as our please. We'll do as we're pleased. Matter of fact, one of the things that hurts most of us is we don't like authority, no matter who that person may be. And we have within our spirit, our sinful spirit, a desire to strive against any authority and all authority, even though Jesus says that all of us should be under authority. And the problem is, is that the greatest authority that we need to bow the knee to is Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who will rule and reign forever. Revelation 21, the new heaven and the new earth, where there has never been the very smell of sin. A place. Oh, I did a funeral this week of a friend, a friend with clay feet. I saw God use him in a great way, but I also saw failure, hardship, and pain. I think it was Christmas Eve 2005. They called me. I left my family about 9 30, 10 o'clock that night. Went up to the emergency room, or actually, it wasn't in the emergency room. It was in the intensive care unit at Stevens County Hospital. He was on a ventilator, and the Dr. Patel uh, said, said he had had enough of him and he wanted to, to take him off the vent that night, Christmas Eve. Darlene, his daughter, said, No, you will not. <laughs> Y'all knew Darlene. <laughs> she overruled the doctor that night. And we prayed. I went up there probably every day for the next 10 days and we prayed. 
they'd let me go back in the intensive care unit. I'm not saying it's my prayers in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I think it was the prayers of all God's people. Only one God knows is all those people coming together in one voice. But they took old Herschel off the vent and he lived until this past week. Only God knows breath. Only God knows life. But for every one of us, a decision has to be made of where we'll spend our eternity. There is no more important question. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is, say it, where are you going to spend your eternity? When our heart is calling us to himself, a longingness for that which is real, a longingness for that which lasts, a longing when that which has meaning. But you see, the problem is, for him to be the Lord of our life, we've got to step off the throne. We've got to get out of the way before we can walk in the way. How many times I've heard when I, when I knew someone was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and I would ask them, would you like to give your heart and life to Christ? They'd say, not now. Not now. Not now. Maybe later. Not now. With eternity laying in the balance. With the author that gives us every breath and we don't know when we'll take our last breath. But when we take our last breath, our eternity is set. It's either going to be in the bliss of Revelation 21, or we will hear the words that Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. Eternity's too long to be wrong. And yet pride keeps us away. We're not willing to bow the knee. Philippians 2 tells us one day, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The only problem with that is some will bow the knee from heaven, but some will bow the knee from the very depths of hell. But it will be everlastingly too late. The, the life of the church is the life of Christ. Our mission is not to please us, but to serve Him. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. We have the privilege of giving every ounce of our energy to the King of Kings unto His service for His glory alone, because He is the author of that which is, and I love this word, best. Are you willing to choose best? He can build a kingdom and he can tear it down. But when Jesus rules the kingdom, he will rule forevermore. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever.